Good morning, everybody. This is Robert Hosh with Big Rack Software. Um, I'm going to do something a little bit different today. I actually set up a really boring PowerPoint. Um, I don't normally do that. I normally use my video camera with my microphone and everything. Uh, Christmas hit the house a little bit hard, and there's just a lot of junk in the background, and I really am not in the mood to clean it all up right now. So I tried something a little bit different. So wanted to talk a little bit about Big Rex software, who we are, what what it is I've been working on, and just some different things I have in mind. So basically, Big Rex software is a nonprofit organization. Um, we do have a 501c3 um, status. Uh, it's based out of Tempe, Arizona. Uh, it's nothing fancy. This is just uh, basically running out of my uh, room here. Um, so I've got like like an office here that I've been setting up. So it started in, I'll look at this page here. Oh yeah, so it got our uh, corporation formation approval in July 10th, 2018. So it's been about a year and a half and I haven't done a whole lot with it yet um, other than getting things set up, working on it. It's just me right now. But we got the EIN in July. We I filed for the 501c3 status in January 2019, so just about a year ago, and we got the approval in February. So it is an official 501c3. It's a nonprofit organization here in Arizona. The basic idea behind what I'm working on here is trying to help people learn how to do some coding. I have some teenage kids. Um, I know other people have people who are interested in learning how to do coding, whether web development, uh, data science, any type of thing. And so the base idea is to help people learn how to do that. There are different ways to learn how to get into computer science and computer coding, web development, you name it. There's all kinds of different things like that. But one way is to go to school, go to four year degree, um, generally, that's people who are just getting out of high school, wanting to go to college, and they decide to go to, you know, get a computer science degree from like Arizona State University or other places similar to that. Um, I only mentioned ASU because they're literally about four or five miles from where we are right here. So it's a very popular school. It's very large. Um, there's a lot of people who go there. They've got a great program. So, I mean, it's it's a very good way to get into computer science. <clears throat> and pardon the cough, because the reason you haven't seen me on YouTube for a while is because I caught bronchitis back at the beginning of October, and what is it, three months later? And I'm pretty much over it, but I've still got a little bit of a sniffle and cough. It's just annoying. So I'll try to keep that to a minimum. But the other ways to learn computer programming is to go to a code boot camp. There are quite a few different good ones. Uh, Lambda School, um, Code Foundry, there's... A bunch of them out there. They are a little bit expensive. I think some of them would cost between ten to fifteen thousand dollars, or maybe even more. They're usually like a like a a full day type thing where you just go in there and that's all you do is code for you know like eight to ten weeks or something like that. Um, you got to be able to take the time off of work or have the free time to travel somewhere and actually sit down and do something like that. They are a really good option. A lot of people are doing that. Um, the other third option is to be self-taught. Um, a lot of us who have been doing computer programming actually have sometimes have a combination of different things. Self-teaching is actually something you're going to do forever if you're in this field of work. You got to learn how to you have to keep up with things. Things change way too fast, and honestly, it's a little frustrating. But it's just how it is. Technology advances very quickly, and you just have to keep up with things. There are a lot of really good ways to do that. So basically, just back to Big Rex. Um, I started Big Rex as an organization. Uh, so far, um, it's just me working here. Um, it's uh, pretty simple. I will be planning. I am planning to maybe partner with some other people in the future as I get this built up a little bit. So it's it's. It, you know, I do want to work with other people. I mean, that's kind of the point of working with a nonprofit is to actually partner with people and actually do some good. But right now, it's just me. I'm the, I'm the board of directors. I'm the president. I am the grand poobah. You name it, I've got all the hats. I'm the finance officer. 
you know, I have to keep track of the accounting. Yeah, it's not something I can do forever because it's just way too much. But, so, I mean, somebody could ask, like, so how does somebody who's just a tiny nonprofit, how do you raise money? Well, there are actually different ways to do that. Um, currently, I do Uber and Lyft. I've been doing Uber and Lyft for two years um, since before I started this. It's basically around the time I was thinking of doing this back in the, I, back in January of 2018, and you know I started doing Lyft. I did that for about three months, and then I added on Uber. Um, they're both pretty fun. They're actually something I get out of the house. I can, you know, I'm not you know stuck watching TV or Netflix or something every single night of the week. I can actually get out and make a little bit of money. Um, it doesn't pay a lot. Honestly, you're probably like if you're going to grow or net about 15 or $20 an hour. Um, I don't need a lot of money for what I'm doing. I know a lot of people try to do Uber and Lyft full time, you know, for actual income. Um, it gets a little complicated. You know, you've got to keep track of your taxes. You're technically a 1099 employee for Uber or Lyft. Um, they take a, you know, the government does take a pretty good chunk of that. So one of the things, since I'm actually working in the tech area here with this nonprofit um, is to help people actually learn how to you know raise a little bit of money for themselves not only doing computer coding but doing tech gig economy type of things gig economy you know be what it may is not really a great way to make a living but it is a good way to get some extra part-time cash if you're looking for Christmas money or just trying to supplement your income um, you know, just get out and you know you can easily make 500 to two thousand dollars a month extra doing, you know, on top of what your regular job is doing. It is a lot of work. It's, I mean, honestly, I think you could probably work for Costco or Starbucks or any other place like that and probably get similar money for the same amount of time. The advantage is you can actually get out and do something completely different. You don't have an actual boss who's bugging you to work exact hours. They're not going to bug you if you're a minute late. You know, they're not going to threaten to fire you if you're late three times, you know, in a week or whatever. Um, you can actually pick your own times to go out and drive. If you want to drive for five minutes, you can turn it on and off as many times as you want. You can go home whenever you want. You can go out whenever you want. It is very flexible. One of the other things I actually experimented with, and experimentation is actually kind of the key of what I do here. I play around with different things, and I'd like to, you know... This isn't supposed to be something we just set and always do the same exact thing. But about a year ago, I was actually working with the bird scooters. And you can actually go pick those up and take them home, plug them into chargers at night, take them back out and drop them off in the morning. A year ago, they were paying $5 per scooter to do that. So it actually kind of made some sense. You could actually go out and make an easy 50 to 80 bucks a night. The only problem was that's at night. They would release the scooters at 10 p.m. You have to go scramble to catch them before every, everybody else did. Load them into a truck or into your trunk of your car, which is always a you know, fun Tetris puzzle. Take them home, plug them in, wait for them to charge up. Then you have to go drop the things back off between 4 and 7 a.m. in the morning. Now, they have changed it since then, and they've also changed how much they pay. They're usually down to about $3. Previously, they started at $5, and as the night went on, they went up in price up to as far as 10 or $15 per scooter. So if you went out at 2 in the morning, you could actually get a little bit of a boost on that. But anyway, I quit doing that. That was not really worth the trouble, and it was messing up with my day job. It was fun. You actually get to bring them home and play with them and actually ride them around for free for the entire night. But you can only do that for so much. If you're a person who's a night owl, you don't have a day job or something, you can make a little bit of extra money. Personally, I recommend Uber and Lyft over that. The other ways I raise money for big rec software is through personal investment. I actually take some of my day job paycheck and I put it into the company, into the business checking account. And, you know, I just kind of supplement that a little bit. If I don't feel like driving a lot of Uber and Lyft, which by the way, Uber and Lyft does pay, I can pay for the entire budget um, using just Uber and Lyft. Um, but if I don't feel like it, or like, for example, the past two months I was sick, I wasn't able to drive Uber and Lyft because people kind of frown on you coughing while you're driving. 
especially if you're coughing your lung up the whole time and you can't make it stop, that it's, yeah, you're not going to be able to do that. So I had to put some extra money from a paycheck into the business just to kind of keep it going. Two other ways, since it is a 501c3, is I can use grants or take donations. I can apply for grants. I can go get money that way. I have not actually pursued that yet, mainly because I'm still building the basis and the foundation of what we're doing, and I don't really want to go out and compete for that money and take it from money who actually from people who probably need it more. There is a limited amount of money out there for this, and I know a lot of local organizations who are working with homeless people and you know other services and things like that do really need the money a lot. It would be kind of silly for me to go compete for that when I can raise some of it on my own. Um, not saying I won't do it in the future, but I'm going to get a little further down the road before I start working on things like that. <coughs> um, I, I have had a couple of donations over the past year and a half. Um, I did have somebody give me a laptop. I've had another person give me a couple of small older CPUs. Um, I actually had somebody give me this, recently a really nice Canon Vixia video camera. I haven't actually used it for YouTube yet, and but it's got a really nice picture. I really like it a lot. I've been playing around with it, um, being sick and coughing. I just haven't set it up, and today I don't really feel like cleaning everything up to have a nice background. Normally everything is pretty straight, but I didn't really feel like it, so... Our budget for the company is approximately three to five hundred dollars a month. The base that I actually have to make per month is two hundred and seventy-five dollars. Um, I normally make about three to five hundred. Um, I've got a variety of different uh, software and things that I actually use for that money. Adobe Photography, for example, I use Photoshop and Lightroom. For those who don't know, I actually do side photography. Um, I've been doing that for years. Um, I like using Canon cameras, DSLR, um, external lighting, all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, Photoshop and Lightroom is actually really good for product photography and editing. And the photography plan is only, what, like $11 a month. It's actually an awesome deal. I use Wasabi Backup. Um, all of my files and everything are backed up to the cloud. I'm paying for about 3 terabytes. Uh, the plan I have is about 5 or $6 per terabyte per month. It's a pretty good deal. Um, I use the Smug Mug Photography Plan for storing photography. Uh, it's a business plan. It's about $25 a month. So I keep you know the files backed up over there. So it's kind of a backup in, this, in addition to Wasabi. But then I can also sell things on there if I need to. I, I don't really, but it's available. Uh, Cox High Speed Internet. It's about $112 a month. I'm paying for that from here. I have an Amazon Music subscription. Which you're probably wondering why do we need a music subscription. But as I'm out there uh, driving for Uber and Lyft, I'm actually able to expense off certain things. Uh, for example, I use Amazon Music and an Amazon Auto Echo microphone, which is kind of a brand new thing. They're about $49, so pretty cool. They plug into your phone, go through Bluetooth, and you can actually listen to pretty much any kind of music you want to. Uh, custom, actually, by the way, the people who are passengers as Uber and Lyft love it. Um, sometimes they'll ask if they can plug in an auxiliary cable, you know, to listen to their own music, and I just tell them, like, just ask Alexa to do it, she'll take care of it. And I get to find out all kinds of cool stuff. I have a Dropbox subscription, um, also for storing various files, and it's, it's, it's really good for transferring files to other people. I've got the general bank fees. We do have a uh, we have a checking account, a savings account, and we also have a MasterCard. So, I mean, not a MasterCard, but it's an American Express card. Um, that's actually through Amazon Prime. I don't use it very much, but it's good for, you know, things here and there. And it's also for building credit. I have a car wash subscription. That's like $29 a month. I can go in any time and get the car washed. Um, you got to have a nice looking car if you're going to be driving around. Um, I have occasional tech office purchases. I have a nice Rode microphone that I purchased. Um, it's actually, I'm trying to remember exactly how much it was. I think it was roughly about $100. I had to go back and look. I got that in a stand. I think it was $150. And then there was, a, there was a Rode stand that was about $99. It's actually plugged onto my desk here and I can, it. I think it has a really good sound. 
the USB microphone that plugs into my laptop. And as I'm using OBS Studio, you know, you can record the audio. Uh, miscellaneous cables. I bought a new computer chair because the one I had before was really old. The uh, hydraulics on it kept sinking every time I sat on it, and it was super creaky, which is really annoying when you're trying to do a video. Miscellaneous expenses related to rideshare. For example, um, gasoline. I can go out and make about $100 for every five or six hours of driving. I'm in Phoenix, Arizona, so um, Uber actually pays out 60 cents a mile plus a little bit per hour for you know picking people up. Um, I think I drive, yeah, my car gets about 30 miles to the gallon, 29, 30, depends on how much I push the gas pedal. I have a Nissan Ultima. It's actually a pretty cool car, but 30 miles to the gallon, and I drive about well, about 150 miles. It uses about 15 mile, you know, 15 dollars worth of gas, and I can usually make 100 from that. You know, and that actually goes into the bank account. So you know, I have to buy gas, occasional oil changes, a couple things like that related to actually working to raise some money here. So what kind of computers do I use? I have. A couple here. I've got a Dell i5 laptop, which, which is the one I'm using right now. I found it at a pawn shop for about, yeah, about two hundred dollars. It's uh, not too bad. It's not like a super high end one. It's like a fifth generation i5. Um, it's just basically your average laptop, but it works really well. I've got a second monitor plugged in, and so I've been using that. I had somebody donate an old Pentium laptop, and the screen was cracked. It's basically not working at all. I took it and installed a, I think I installed a solid state hard drive into the thing and I installed Linux Mint onto it and plugged in into a, a second monitor, use that for the primary monitor and it's actually, it's a 32 bit machine. It's, not, it's, it's really not a good machine at all, but um, it actually runs fast enough with Linux Mint on it to watch Netflix and it, and it doesn't get, you know, it doesn't lag and it works really well. So it's mostly for experimenting and playing around. My Dell i5 is a Windows 10. That's generally what I prefer to use. Um, I also use something called Oracle VM VirtualBox, and that lets you install uh, virtual machines onto, you know, your actual machine on your on your own computer. So if you want to try out different things, different versions of Linux and other servers and things like that, you can actually run those in concurrence with Windows 10. And I believe that also works on Linux. I haven't tried it out yet. I've been installing Linux Mint straight onto the hard drives and, you know, actually booting from them. As I said before, Adobe Photoshop and Lightroom is something I use. I use Microsoft Office all the time, but if you're on Linux Mint, um, it comes with a free Office. Um, drawing a blank, but anyway, that it has its own version. It works really well. And I think you guys can hear some birds in the background. I can hear them pretty clearly. Um, they're out in the living room and they're a little parallel and a ring-tailed parakeet they're pretty noisy but anyway there's a where was I so OBS studio and DaVinci Resolve are something that I use for you know video editing and they're both free and they're really nice for that I like to use Visual Studio 2017 2019 which is something I just started installing and playing with and Visual Studio Code for doing you know, JavaScript coding, React, Node, things like that. Veracrypt is actually a really cool application also. You can actually set up a per, uh, encrypted partition into a file on your machine. So for example, if I want to have 100 gigabytes of encrypted, uh, we're talking heavy encryption, um, sometimes double encryption, it'll actually do two different encryption algorithms on top of each other. But you can actually keep, you know, personally sensitive files inside this partition, and you can, you know, if you do it as a file, you can put it on a hard drive, and you actually can take it with you. And if the hard drive gets stolen, nobody's going to be getting into this. It's it'll keep it safe. <coughs> so anyway, my name's Robert Hosh. Um, let's see here. I've got my background. Um, I'm actually a computer programmer, software developer. I've been doing this for I don't know how many years. Um, I started doing actual IT work in 1997, and I learned how to do HTML and related CSS. Well, CSS wasn't out yet, but 
I learned HTML, you know, on my own. Um, I graduated from school in 1993, which back then pretty much everything that was out was COBOL, Fortran, RPG, um, old stuff that you don't really use a lot more. You, you'll see COBOL being used on occasion here, but um, usually for older companies that have mainframes. But I went to school. I do have a Bachelor of Science in uh, Computer Science. I uh, got it from Pensacola Christian College in, Flor in Pensacola, Florida. It's a small school, nothing too crazy. But they had a pretty good price on the on college, and so I was able to afford it, and I was able to actually get through it without having to, you know, in addition to working part-time and doing things on the side during the summer and the winter, I was actually able to get out of there without too much debt, um, which was pretty unusual these days. Um, I know prices have gone up a lot since then, so that's probably not as realistic. I mean, I used to deliver pizza and do other stuff, and, you know, that was actually a good way to make a little bit of extra money, but... Um, so what do I listen to during the day? Well, I listen to all kinds of stuff. I will sometimes pull up YouTube on the side. Um, I like to watch a variety of different things. Um, sometimes prank videos and things like that. They always amuse me. But as far as music goes, if I'm trying to actually get into focus and actually work on things, I like heavy metal. I like symphonic metal, uh, EDM, EBM. So the difference between EDM and EBM, EDM is, you know, your electronic dance music, um, some techno trance, things like that, vocal trance. It usually helps me kind of just that constant beat, just kind of, you know, with the DJ mixes and things like that actually helps me, you know, concentrate and focus. And I can put on like an hour long um, DJ mix or something like that. And I can actually just, it helps me concentrate. For some reason, it just helps distract my head from thinking about other stuff and getting distracted. EBM is something called electronic body music. It's it's more of a it, it's also electronica. It's more of a darker industrial style music. Um, something I've been listening to for a long time. I, that helps a lot also. So when I graduated in 1993, I did not get computer uh, programming or anything like that straight out of school. It actually took me three and a half years before I broke in. So at the time. Um, trying to find that kind of work, um, the internet hadn't really, well, it was out. I mean, different, you know, colleges and universities were using it quite a bit, but the World Wide Web hadn't really come out yet. I think it was still in some development at the time for the first few years. And so I was actually working for a company called CompuLink out of Florida. And I think they're actually still in existence, but I was actually doing computer cabling fiber optics, telephone cabling, installing ethernet cables. So basically construction work in commercial businesses, installing all of the uh, network cabling. So I did that for three and a half years. I was able to get a job as a crew leader where I was actually in charge of other people and different crews. And we actually worked with as different crews and were able to get some pretty major projects done for like Disney and, you know, Charles Schwab and other things like that, other companies. There was, Quite a few of them in the Orlando area. So I did that for three and a half years. I started out making minimum wage and I made got all, all the way up to 12 bucks an hour after three and a half years. So basically we're starving. But yeah, it was working. I was able to you know, kind of in the IT area networking side, got to learn a lot about that. And it was actually very useful. So breaking into the IT field at the time, so computers at the time, <laughs> What, 1996, I was on CompuServe at the time, and I was learning how to, I found some books on HTML, I was starting to hear about it a little bit more, and so I started learning that on the side, I started doing it, you know, made some really s simple websites, I mean, at the time, these were really basic, but I started learning a little bit about it, and I actually started sending out some resumes to some different companies, and an IT recruiting firm at the time got a hold of me and offered me a job with Lockheed Martin in Orlando. And so I was able to get in there and I had never done this before. And they were just starting out, you know, experimenting with, experimenting with some of the stuff. They had an old, what was it? A Macintosh web server that they'd set up using something called WebStar. It's really old, but 
you know, they had a whole stack of nine gigabyte hard drives, you know, on SCSI interfaces attached to this old um, Macintosh computer. And they were actually serving up photo collections for the entire company. Um, somehow they had gotten a, you know, a little contract with uh, the corporate headquarters and they were storing some of their, you know, historical photos from Lockheed Martin's original days, all the different companies as they had merged together. And they were serving those up so that people could use those for trade shows and for graphics and for you know, presentations and different things. So it was a historical photos. It was really cool. Uh, we had thousands of photos sitting on these hard drives. And so that's how, that's how I broke in. And I worked there for eight years and then moved to Arizona after that. And ever since I've been doing a variety of different contracting and, you know, con either contracting or permanent jobs, different things like that. So I've been, you know, I'm still working in that field, you know, still today. So you, some people ask, is college required to work in IT? It definitely, I, I definitely do feel that it helps. Uh, computer science is difficult to learn. I think anybody can learn it if you want to. I do think it's difficult and it takes a lot of focus and concentration and you need to spend time on a consistent basis working on your craft and working on different technologies and learning coding and programming languages, data structures, algorithms, and all that fun stuff. And it, it, is, a, it is a little bit difficult to do. So I think one thing, if you're somebody who needs a structured environment, I think going to school is a very good idea. Um, is it required to work in IT? No, I don't think so. Um, I think over probably half of the people I've met since who are computer software engineers and are working in, the, in web development have probably never been to college. It is not required. Uh, there are some companies who they say they require it in order to work for them. Um, I'm not, but that's not everybody. What advantage does given attending college give you? Well, it, it depends because, you know, learning some of the computer science algorithms. I mean, when you go to job interviews, even today, they do ask you some whiteboard questions and they start asking you things about hash tables and can you do the Fibonacci sequence and all these, you know, what are trees and, you know, binary search and all that kind of stuff. And a lot of the stuff you will learn in college. And if you don't do it in college, well, you have to figure it out on your own. And sometimes you don't know to do that. And to be perfectly honest, I kind of suck at some of this stuff. So, and I even went to school and it's been a while, but it's just one of those things you have to self-teach and keep up with. So my website is sandangel.com. I've had that for a long time. Um, if you want to look at my resume, I'm not going to talk about the companies I currently work for or anything like that here online, but you know, it's not hard to figure that out. So why is this a boring PowerPoint? I think I sort of touched on that before, mainly because I'm just testing this out. Um, and like I said, I don't feel like cleaning the room here. <clears throat> How do you find work? If you want to get into this field, there are a lot of different ways to do it. Um, like referrals and networking. I mean, if you have some friends who are in the field, you can do that. But let's be frank, if you're brand new to this, Odds are probably good. You probably don't know a lot of people who are doing that. You can get in as a direct permanent hire. Um, send your resume out. You know, talk to people. Try to find hiring managers. And it's something who is somebody who's experienced that, that actually doesn't work. Too, it's not too hard to do. If you're brand new, if you're a junior developer, breaking in is difficult. Um, I have always... And this is this is across the board, no matter if I'm working for IT or not working for IT, but I've always gone through temp agencies. I think temp agencies are very useful ways to find work quickly. Not necessarily the highest paying work, but you can actually go in and you know get some work and that's you know, one time I actually got placed out of a warehouse pulling weeds out front of their office. You know, super exciting. I did that for three days and I was like, I'm done. And then I end up working for the CompuLink company, um, actually, again, through a temp agency. They, they're the ones who found that work. That's how I got into that. It's not like I was just like, I had absolutely no construction experience. I had never worked in that type of work. They stuck me in there. I 
almost got fired a few times over the first couple months just because I was having a hard time keeping up and learning it. But eventually it started clicking and I just was able to keep it up and I was able to get better at it. And eventually I got up to a crew leader position. I probably could have moved up higher if I had stuck around longer, but I wanted to get into programming. So that's why I kind of worked my way out of it. Uh, recruiters who work for temp agencies, but they're actually known as recruiters or headhunters, are probably your best friend in the whole world. Um, almost all the work I have found has been through recruiters. And once you've got some experience, once you're in for a couple of years and working, um, putting your resume onto things like monster.com, careerbuilder.com, uh, Indeed, Jobbing, LinkedIn, and all of that, Recruiters will find you and start offering you jobs. No, a lot of times they'll offer you a lot of jobs that you are just, you're not a fit for. And honestly, they work in commission and they're just trying to figure out, you know, get anybody to, you know, you know, to be placed by them so they get their commission check. Um, there are pros and cons to working with recruiters. I'm not going to go into that right now, but they are an actual, it's a, it's a very good way to find some work. taking a drink of water here <laughs> actually coffee I had to stay awake so getting your first job is easier said than done it is very difficult um for some reason you know companies want experience but how do you get experience if you've never worked um this actually is something that is a problem across the board in any industry sometimes you can break into a temp agency and get it like an entry-level job um but if you're actually doing this on your own it does help a lot to create a portfolio. Now that said, my portfolio, I mean, I probably should have been keeping screen grabs and things. I actually have some somewhere, but I have to dig them out of a hard drive somewhere. I've got like 80 hard drives sitting in our desk drawer here. Um, I could probably find a few things, but creating a portfolio online is a really good way, especially if you're a junior developer and just getting started. Um, you're gonna need a GitHub account. You can put things up there. You can put that on your resume and you can you know, so some coding projects that you've worked on. If you contribute to some online projects you know, through GitHub or other locations, you can use that. Um, and I would definitely put those on your resume. Any volunteer work that you do for any organization, for any type of volunteering work, I would always put that on a resume. Um, I actually worked for with Civil Air Patrol for several years here, not currently, but in the past, and we did search and rescue. And I also helped them with websites and other odds and ends here and there. I did some finance work with them. And it's it just it's just a good way to show that you're you know, you're out there and you're motivated and you're doing other work and you're helping people out. I mean it actually I think it actually helps out. Uh doing personal projects. A lot of companies they probably say that personal projects don't count, um, side projects don't count, you know, this isn't real experience. I mean, I have heard this. But it also shows that you're out there learning. I think it is important to put those types of things onto your resume and link to those. Um, getting a first job, I think, is an area, and this has been a problem for years, it's an area that needs improvement. There needs to be better ways to make this work. So what ideas do I have for Big Rex? Well, I've already set up a learning page with YouTube videos linked. If you go to bigrex.com slash learn, and I don't think it matters if it's capitalized or not. But um, anyway, if you go there, there are several categories set up with, and this is something I've been working on for the last year or so, but I found some YouTube videos that are pretty cool on different topics, and I've split those up by topic, and you can go in there and actually start getting a head start on things. Is it all-inclusive? No, it's not. There's a lot more I could do. Um, but it's a good start. And once you go in there and start watching some of the videos, you'll start seeing who the, who the people are that make the videos. Your uh, video recommendations on the right side of YouTube are going to start showing up. And you can just follow that rabbit hole. And next thing you know, two years later, you, you can learn a lot. Now, the website I've set up is in WordPress. WordPress is actually really cool. It's, it's really good for setting up basic websites. It's very fast. And once you learn it, it's definitely, I like it a lot. However, they did change something recently for the editing page where you go to edit the content and they switched it from basically just typing in, you know, straight text and HTML and put these things I call blocks into it. I personally, it bugs the crap out of me. I, I can't stand it. 
So I think it's cumbersome to edit it. I got tired of putting in links. I probably got over 100 links on the page already or in the, in the sub pages altogether. And I'm, it's just, I don't know, it's bugging me. So I'm setting up a database on the back end to store the, the link resources. I'm using REST API and I'm currently going to be using Node.js and MongoDB. WordPress is built on PHP and MySQL, which is pretty cool. Uh, definitely worth learning, uh, but I hadn't used Mongo before. It's not a SQL database, and so it's something I just wanted to try out. I found a Udemy video or Udemy course that uses that, so I wanted to. I'll go into that more detail later. But basically, I'm setting up a back end to store the resources, and then I'm going to set up a front end website or set of pages, and I may actually redo the entire website. And I'm going to use React, which is basically JavaScript. Um, so I'm going to use that to replace first the learning page so it can be a database to search and categorize all the, the links. I've got another probably 100 links that I want to add to the site. This is why I want to do this a little bit differently. I'm just done pacing. So I'm in the middle of a project to work on that right now. Later on, after I get done with that, and we're probably talking a couple months here. This isn't going to happen right away. I had this big idea I was going to be done by Thanksgiving or Christmas and, well... We're at the New Year's here, so it's not happening. And I've just been busy doing other stuff. So I also want to build a project to help people match jobs to skills. And I know there's a million job websites out there. I've got some unique ideas on it, I think, that I'm going to go play with. Um, so I'm just going to mess with that later. I want to provide a basic coding framework to help people learn. And by that, I mean... I'm going to have some of this code set up and if I can find some people who are actually interested in trying to get some experience, I'll probably work with some people locally here first and they can help me work on the code base and, you know, for these different projects and they can start getting them some real world, ex real, real world experience. And after that, I want to try to partner with some recruiters and help find people find jobs. Maybe even starting, you know, later on helps, helps people get placed into staffing which could be a potential income stream, by the way. So that's kind of why I'm going this direction. It, I, I think, personally, as far as Big Rex goes, I think, I mean, like I said, I was, I was talking about different ways for people to make money or for the company to make money. And I think going for grants and doing things like that is useful. I can see there's be some good reasons to do that, to work on some community projects. However... It's a lot of work to go apply for grants, and sometimes you're only going for a thousand dollars, and they want you to, you know, explain everything you've ever done with the whole history of the company, and you know, the grant applications can almost take more time than it's worth getting the money for. I'd actually like this to be somewhat self-sufficient. So, if the company can actually, you know, develop some software, you know, software projects that are maybe open source things like that, but you know, can also make some money from subscriptions and you know, content provi providing and different things of that nature. You know, it can make its own money. So what is wrong with job interviews? So I think, I think personally, the interview process varies from company to company. Um, different companies have different ways of interviewing. Some will bring you in. They'll just talk about the projects they're working on. Um, others want you to do these really complicated algorithm whiteboarding exercises with no way to look things up. I think those are kind of really difficult to prepare for. Um, that's where the computer science degree actually can help out a lot because you've been doing it and you've got to, you know, be very familiar with, you know, the different data structures and concepts. I personally think those are worth learning anyway. Um, it's not so much about trying to pass a job interview, but these are concepts that are very, very useful. You're going to need to know some of the stuff, data patterns and different object oriented patterns and things like that are, are very, very useful to know. Let's see, but I think it's important, but here's the thing. I think some of these things, they'll go into that. Some of these data structures, algorithms and trick questions and all these different like math questions and stuff they like to ask. Honestly, as a web developer, you rarely use those in real life. You, you're not going to be using a lot of that. Some of the software patterns are useful, you know, for setting up, you know, software architecture, trying to set up how applications work. I think those are useful concepts, but a lot of the stuff you get there and, and you know, like for example, C sharp, you know, the basic framework, a lot of that stuff's built in already. You're never going to be doing this from scratch. 
you're just going to be using concepts. So you need to know the concepts, but you're never going to be building these from scratch. So I think it's sometimes they, I think they ask the wrong questions trying to figure out, you know, who's the smartest person that they can hire. Um, I don't know if it's really the most efficient way to do this. And I, I know a lot of people think this also, but, and I'm not going to cite my sources on that. <laughs> so anyway, but it's important to know these things, but I think interviewers, viewers also frequently ask some of the same questions. Um, they're just basic programming questions and you know, you can get some books, you can read up on these basic coding questions. I mean, there are a million websites out there on, you know, how to prepare for code interviews. And honestly, I, th I think if you take about the same hundred questions, odds are good, you're going to, you're going to see these over and over and over. So all you have to do is memorize them, which, you know, if you can memorize them, then you're pretty much get your foot in the door. So does that mean you're a good coder? Absolutely not. It doesn't mean anything. Some companies will give you take home tests and you know, they'll say, here, go, go build this thing on the side and you can take it, go home and, you know, give it a day or so you need to turn it back in. They'll sit you in great, you know, sit and grade you on how well you did with it. I actually had one company do that and I did the whole test. It was a C sharp framework test. I went in after that interviewed in person and they sat down and had me do some actual coding troubleshooting, you know, with one of their lead developers and I got hired for the job and guess what I worked on for the next whole year? Nothing to do with C sharp. It was actually visual basic. So, so I'm not even sure why they bothered, but anyway, so it's not even, it doesn't even always match up, but I think, I think take home tests are probably a, a more efficient way of doing things. So the last option here, I have progressive training with tests. Let me explain that. Um, I've got a friend of mine who's actually getting a job with a, a local cruise line here. And what they're doing is they're bringing their people in to work on the phones to help, you know, schedule airplane trips for people to travel, you know, across the world to meet up with their cruises, like river cruises in Europe and things like that. And what they're doing is they're bringing them in and actually doing paid training. And they come in, it's like a training class for eight weeks. And every week at the end of the week, they have to take a test and get a certain percentage to pass and continue on. Otherwise, they're done. So, I kind of wonder if that wouldn't be it. I've never heard of that being done with um, software engineering, but something to think about. Maybe you could bring somebody in, do a little bit of training, see how they're, you know, actually some or, or hands-on work with, you know, your actual code base, and give them a test, see how well they're paying attention, and if they're able to keep going, then you, you keep them going. So, kind of like a trial period. <coughs> might want to experiment with that a little bit later. But there are different ways to prepare for interviews and leakcode.com is a great, great website for learning some of those complicated um, coding algorithms and data structures. There are a lot of really good YouTube programming channels. You can self-learn, self-teach yourself. Um, there are good books out there, like for example, Cracking the Coding Interview. There's several others out there also. Um, they talk about some of the things you'll find on leakcode. Uh, Udemy is the online training website, which is, they, there are several good uh, people out there. You can make your own projects, um, get that set up. You definitely need to have a, a good resume. And by a good resume, it just needs to have the good keywords and all that. There's, it's not super complicated, but you definitely can't have any typos on it. People will notice. <coughs> Online job boards, I think I kind of touched on that before, and then LinkedIn, always, you should always have a LinkedIn account. You know, and, and you can go on there and play around with it. So we're almost done here, but my favorite U U uh, YouTube resources, Traverse e Media is probably my favorite coding uh, YouTube channel. He goes into all kinds of stuff. He's actually on Udemy also, which I'll touch on in a second, but he's got some really good stuff. Web Dev Simplified is, a little bit newer channel, I think, and he's actually been touching on some of the job interview things like, you know, talking about object oriented coding and some of the different concepts there that you're definitely going to be asked about. You definitely will be asked about some of these. I've been asked about them over and over and over some of these, and he actually does a great job of explaining them. Uh, Real Tough Candy, 
Um, she's really good. She has some really cool stuff to go watch. And some really good stuff. Coder Foundry is actually from a, a boot camp. And he focuses on uh, C Sharp. C Sharp frameworks. And I think definitely C Sharp is something you need to know if you're going to be getting into enterprise or corporate web programming. Uh, there's a lot of people who do JavaScript like React and Node. Very important to learn those also, but I think C-sharp is definitely something you can't forget about. And it is a little complicated. There's a lot to it, but I th it's definitely something you need to know. And I like his channel because he doesn't forget about that. Joshua Fluke is a lot of fun to watch. Uh, he talks about different corporate um, interviewing processes and different stuff. So Andy Sterkowitz and Free Code Camp, back-to-back uh, -back SWE Software Engineering. Um, it's a... He's got some really cool stuff about algorithms. He actually goes in, into a, like, I don't know, an actual whiteboard and actually shows how to solve them on uh, different things. He's, it's a lot of fun to watch. I, I've learned a lot from him. Udemy is a great way to learn some stuff. Brad Tra Traversy, which is Traversy Media. Um, I highly recommend if you're brand new to this, starting out with modern HTML and CSS from the beginning and then going to modern JavaScript. His Node.js API Masterclass is something I'm working on currently. I'm probably about halfway through it, and it's definitely worth the money. Now, Udemy, it's kind of tricky. Sometimes you go in there and you'll see some of the courses cost $150 or $200. Um, if you just kind of wait a month or just hang out for a little bit, set up an account, you'll start getting some discounts. And by discounts, I mean some of the courses are $9.99 for Black Friday, or they're about $14.99. You know, these are st stupidly cheap. Um, honestly, they're worth $200 each. Or more but I would highly recommend going to Brad Traversy getting his modern HTML and going you know, going from there if you already have experience node.js API is definitely worth it my very first Udemy coding course was by Steven Greider uh, the modern react with redux I like this one a lot uh, it's it's a really good course and it goes into great detail on, on react it's it's actually up to date with 2019 and because you know, it changes a lot. But he's also got another one called Advanced React. I have not started that, but based on the one I'm in currently, um, I'm expecting it's going to be a, it's going to be worth it. All right. So Brian B. Shuffle Dance Masterclass. What does this have to do with anything to do with coding? Absolutely nothing. It's just fun to watch. Um, so if you actually like to go out and try some of this stuff, no, I'm 48 years old. I'm not really going to be a master dancer or anything. But this is kind of cool. I like it. Um, so there's different stuff to watch. And it's always good to get some exercise. So anyway, this is Big Rex Software. Uh, I've got, you know, BigRex.com is our website. We're also on Facebook, Instagram, and GitHub. Uh, so GitHub actually has not a whole lot of stuff on it, but um, I'm actually working on that Node.js um, backend uh, REST API website. Um, I've actually got some of the code actually on there if you want to start looking at it. It's going to be changed. It's in progress. But as I work on the React front end, I'm going to put some of the code up there for people to look at, and you can start seeing how I'm doing some of the coding. So anyway, I appreciate you hanging in there. If you've been here this long, well, thank you. And I'll talk to you guys later. Thanks.